everybody, welcome back to The Hobby Musician. You're joining us today as we are right in the middle of our current building process. Um, but don't worry, if you want to get caught up on anything before, or if you want to jump around to the different phases of the build and find whatever's more applicable to what you're working on, click the link at the top right now, and that will open up a playlist where I've arranged just the episodes in this specific build. Well, the name of the game today is Next. We're going to talk about everything that we did from start to finish to get us to the point where I'm holding this neck right here, with one exception. The only note that I have for that is, as I was preparing, you know, uh, getting everything ready for this video, I realized that when it comes to the angled headstock that we made, the steps and the care and the thought that goes into just making that headstock angle really warrants its own full episode. So once you're done with this, go ahead, use that playlist we talked about, and click in to watch that dedicated video that'll show you all the steps you need to know to kind of do a DIY um, angled headstock all, you know, for your own projects. That's the only kind of exception to what I'm gonna cover in this video. Okay, well then, with that out of the way, how did we start? Well, we started the same way we started with the body blanks. We're using reclaimed or salvaged wood, so I didn't go and buy a piece of lumber. I had to make my piece of lumber. And here I've got examples of the pieces I ended up using. Now in this big order of uh, modular desks that we used for, for the body blanks, there were also these little thinner strips that I think um, got used when you install shelves. You, you know, install one on one side, one on the other side, and then you can set a shelf across it. Well, there was a whole pile of leftover pieces. Some were longer, some were shorter, some had notches cut into them. But the guys that were, um, you know, doing that project, they said, look, this is all junk. Take whatever you want. We're going to throw it away anyway. So what I did was I came back and I needed to laminate these together. So laminating is just a fancy word for gluing together small pieces to make a bigger piece. And you can see in this picture, that's what we did. Um, I pulled out pieces that were long enough, glued them all together to make um, planks or boards. But the one issue I ran into was I realized if you look at the profile here, I could make it as thick as, or as wide as I needed but the, the height was not tall enough. So I ended up making two identical boards. And then after that first gluing was done, I pulled out the thickness planer you can see here, uh, ran them through just because some of the glue had kind of squeezed out the top and the bottom. And I wanted to make sure that I recreated perfectly flat tops and bottoms uh, faces. Then I just glued one board onto the other board. And once I had that done, now I had a blank um, that was thick enough for us to come back and do the rest of the process. Okay, well what happened next? Well the very next thing is the one thing that we're gonna skip for this video. The very next thing that I took care of was I cut in and created um, our angled headstock. So that was um, the next piece of that and once we got that done and taken care of, now is time to put the internal workings. So to cut a truss rod cavity, I use kind of a DIY technique, it's super easy to do. I have a board that I know, it's, it's a really long board, and I know one of the edges is dead straight. So I clamp that board to my, my workstation, and then I set down my neck blank next to it, and I took my router and I used the bit, and I, I had my center line drawn, and I lined up the router bit with the, the end, or the one end of the truss rod where I needed it, and then I moved it around until the route, router hit the board that was clamped, and then I clamped this end of the neck. Then I picked up the router and moved it down to this end. And once I lined it up here and moved it and clamped it down, now I've created, and I double checked everything, now I have created a situation where as I slide that router anywhere along that length, because I lined up both ends perfectly, I know that the middle, I'm gonna have a straight line, no sweat, um, ability to kind of route that really long straight channel. The last tip I'll give you for uh, routing your own truss rod is you're going to need to really go incrementally. I would really recommend doing the eighth inch, quarter inch um, of that bit and make a pass. Then stop, readjust it, and make it a little longer until you've done it piece by piece and deeper and deeper and deeper until you finally have the depth you need. You don't want to try to set the bit at the full depth you need and do it in one pass 
you're going to run the risk of burning out the bit, breaking the bit, or you know, getting bound up and then it jumps out and kind of ruins the rest of your neck blank. So do it little by little, use a straight edge, and there's nothing to cutting out that, that uh, cavity. Okay, well you got the cavity cut out. The next big project is, well, you got to get the truss rod in there and then we've got to sandwich on top our final fingerboard. Now this is where I have kind of my, my one disclaimer on this project. I know I make a big deal about salvaging materials and we only use things we find, but there's one part of any build that I just have to buy lumber and I have to buy lumber um, for the fingerboard. I've learned through personal experience just how important having a reliable, solid, good quality piece of lumber for the playing surface um, is very, very important. So we also got the tips from Rob that Rob actually prefers instruments with a maple fingerboard. So I went online, found a nice piece of maple, and you can see here it really has gorgeous kind of grain patterns that go through it. So I bought that maple fingerboard, but then once it arrived, it's time to glue it in. Now remember, you don't want glue getting into your truss rod. So you use a little piece of masking tape, you cover the truss rod, then you spread glue um, on the top of your neck blank and the, you know, you could just do it there because the fingerboard will smash on top. But then you can remove the tape after you spread the glue around and now, and now the glue is not gonna get down in that truss rod. But one of the things that I do to guarantee that I can clamp and glue this fretboard on exactly where I want is I use some guide screws. Now I'll take some just normal tension clamps and I'll get the fingerboard where I want it and I'll clamp it just with some tension clamps. Then all of these boards come with overhang. They're always going to be bigger than you actually need. So I will come into some of that area that's beyond what I'm going to keep and I drill in a couple holes. I'll do a couple up at the top and maybe one or two uh, kind of midway down the neck big enough that I can have screws there. So when I end up finally smashing down, I got the glue in there and I put the fretboard down, those screws will hold the entire fingerboard in place. So I can come back and clamp all up and down this neck, but if it tries to slide or shift or move at all, those screws hold it in place so it's exactly where you planned it to be when everything's set and finished. Okay, so we've got the majority of this put together. What's left? Well, what's left is let's turn it around to the back and we're going to talk about how we make this curve. Now, um, I used a technique on this that I picked up from watching a ton of videos over at Crimson Guitars. Um, they do great tutorials and so I'm just copying one of the methods that they talk about and they show it's the facet method. So what we do here is remember at this point the the neck is still perfectly flat here and perfectly flat on the sides basically like a rectangle well with the center line that we already had drawn what i do is i measure i i find out how far it is from the center line to the edge and then i i measure the halfway point and i draw a second line that's exactly halfway from the center to the edge so i've got a half a halfway of a halfway. Then I turn it on its side. Remember, this is still flat. So I measure the whole width and I draw a halfway line. So I have a halfway line here and a halfway line on the back. Now you can clamp this down and some people like to use files or uh, so I just grab my angle grinder with a sandpaper disc on it and all you need to do is connect up with one face the halfway line on each end of that. So I just went back and forth. I went through passes and passes and that makes a flat surface. But now that flat surface is joining the halfway line. So now the profile of the neck is no longer flat on top and flat on the side. There's a little bit of the flat still left, but then there's an angle and then there's a little bit flat. You're starting to almost create like a trapezoid, like a weird trapezoid shape. Well, it's called faceting technique because this is also iterative. You can do this again. Now on your new flat surfaces, you measure them, put a center line on it, go back to the flat space, put a center line on that and connect up those two. Little by little, pass after pass after pass, you're making flat surfaces and they're shorter and shorter and shorter 
and pretty soon those flat surfaces start to blur together into a curve. And after a few of those passes, I put down the angle grinder and I switch over to just a hand file. You can kind of file off the last of those uh, edges, uh, if there even are edges anymore, and then after the filing's done, you go through your series of sandpaper to get this beautifully smooth, beautifully curved, and comfortable neck profile, all with hand tools and rulers. Um, so it's a really, really cool technique. It's really easy to do. And even though I'm really, uh, I'm brand new to that technique, I had no trouble at all um, in, in accomplishing that and getting a really comfortable feeling um, curve to the back of the neck. Okay, the one last thing that we're gonna talk about is this crazy configuration you see right here on the top. After all of that stuff was done, I turned my attention to the markings and the frets and the not frets and everything that you see here. Well, if you do remember what we talked about in the initial episode when we met Rob, Rob was talking about this idea that he was, he was interested in trying to find new creative outlets uh, for, for songwriting, and one of the ideas he had was, what if the instrument itself was a way or a source for him to find creative inspiration? So this idea of, well, you could have all frets, like a, I don't know, traditional normal guitar. You could have all fretless, like a traditional fretless. But he was thinking, what about something that was a hybrid? So partially fretted and partially fretless. So that in this case, something like rhythm chords, like if you're just holding down a rhythm section of a song, you would have about five frets that you could kind of hold down kind of normal chord shapes. But then if a solo section or a bridge section came up, you could really kind of explore the upper reaches of a fretless and you never have to change instruments. So I, in order to accomplish that, what I did was I took my fret saw and I measured out all where the frets should be, but I measured them all out and I cut every single fret. So I made sure that if, you know, I handed this off to somebody else, they could install all 24 frets here. But you can see here, I only installed the first five. Then what I did to create the fretless, um, you know, portion, the rest of the neck, that's where these paints come in. Now, um, these are just enamel paints um, that I went down to the local kind of craft store um, and they dry really, really hard. Um, oh, and quick note, I don't, um, nobody's sponsoring these videos, but if you ever want to see or use some of the products you see, I'll put some Amazon affiliate links down below so you can click in and see exactly the tools and, and paints and everything I use for this. But I made sure that I got the fluorescent or the same fluorescent colors that I'm planning for the body of this guitar for the, the crazy swirled paint job. I wanted to make sure that I matched those colors because I wanted to bring the design elements of the body up into the neck. And that's what I plan to do with the frets. That's why you can see these colors. I then got one of these disposable syringes and this is a plastic, this isn't even a metal syringe. These are, um, you can also find these in, in hobby shops, craft shops. Um, it's just for application, um, applying liquid. So this is a plastic tube, but it's super, super thin. And I got it because it's thin enough that it fit inside the grooves that I cut for the frets. So I drew up, I sucked up the paint that I needed and very carefully squirted and applied it into the, the, the frets that I chose, as well as cutting in the, the circles, the Fostner bit, uh, for the, the markers that you see on the top. Now the glue that I use does dry over time, and when glue, or not glue, the paint, when the paint dries, no matter what you're using, the volume shrinks. So even though when I applied it, it was level to the surface, as I would come back in a couple hours and it would actually have sunk down. So I had to go through several coats, but I, I gradually coated in or built up the, the level of paint so that now when you run your finger across, um, I built it up to the level of the fingerboard. And as you can see in this picture, it was a messy process. The paint was a little difficult to work with and a little bit of it would kind of run you know, over the top of the surface. But the best part about this 
was that after it was dry, I came back with some fine grit sandpaper and I was able to then work back little by little, sand back that excess paint. And once I had sanded away the extra paint, then the sandpaper was going back and forth on the wood and it wasn't hitting the fret anymore. And the clean, crisp, perfectly straight lines visually came back uh, onto the fretboard. So after the frets, you know, I, I put in the, the first five frets, uh, painted the rest of the markers and all the fret lines, the last thing to do was to seal it. So I pulled out the true oil. We use that on every single project we do here. And I put coat after coat after coat. I really recommend going thin. I, I do really thin, light coats, but I do a lot of them. Uh, some people do a few coats, but they just slop it all on at once. Hey, to each their own. Um, but that's how we got this nice kind of um, shine to it, this nice protective finish that's going to keep this uh, playing for years and years. So in the end, that's how we took uh, little leftover strips of lumber like this, put it all together, some TLC and some uh, time, and now we've ended up with um, a neck just like this. Now, sure. This headstock is blank because I'm going to do the same uh, paint swirl uh, on the headstock that we do for the body, so that's coming up later. But other than that, that is how we put together this neck. So I hope you got something out of that. I want to thank you so much for watching, and until next time, play on, my friends. Play on.